process and other infections. I welcome you, sir, on our platform. As I read the structure of webinar, as you could see that we have raised the pre-poll, I request all the participants to kindly submit their polls. As I deliver the welcome note, I would hand over the platform to Dr. Sumit Navani, who would be taking up the first session on TB and, co and its comorbidities. Uh, after that, Dr. Nikhil Sarandar would, show, uh, would enlighten us with the case presentations related to TB and its comorbidities. After both the speaker sessions, we would have a 10 minutes Q&A section and a vote of thanks would be de uh, delivered. I, the general instructions of the webinars are, all the participants will be muted during this webinar. If you have any qu queries, please type in Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in chat sections. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of webinar by the moderator. This session will be recorded and the recording would be shared uh, via emailers, email notifications once the recorder is available. Polls will be raised at the start and the end of sessions. So I request all the participants to kindly submit their feedbacks. I would like to take a moment to thank uh, Viatris for supporting us throughout this webinar. Viatris is a committed uh, Viatris is committed to meaningfully reducing the burden of both non-communicable and infectious diseases by leveraging our scientific, medical, manufacturing, and commercial expertise to develop holistic and integrated solutions for diagnostics and prevention of diseases. It is also a global leader in treating infection diseases such as HIV AIDS, hepatitis, and tuberculosis and offer an extensive portfolio across these diseases. As, you, as we have seen that high income countries face infectious diseases and it is a great challenge for us. So from manufacturing a pediatric friendly enteroviral, it is used to treat HIV uh, positive infants and providing an HIV self test in some low and middle income countries. Beatrice is innovating for help to patients. With this, I would like to stop sharing my screen and hand over the platform to Dr. Sumit Nawani for the first speaker session. Over to you, sir. Thanks a lot, Dr. Shubhi, for your uh, fine introduction. Uh, I would like to at the outset, uh, I welcome uh, you, uh, to you all to the webinar on the TV and your home audience. And I would like to thank Medical Learning Hub for giving me this opportunity. So starting with a small quote, when you focus on problems, you will have more problems. And when you focus on possibilities, you will have more opportunities. So with this thought, uh, I'm just giving a problem statement of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is very rampant, as we all know. And in the year 2020, itself, around 1.5 million people died of tuberculosis. And incidence was around 10 million in that very year. And of these 10 million people, 1.1 million were children. And uh, as we all know, India has the highest burden of tuberculosis in the world. So uh, coming to the point uh, the webinar is all about it's TB and comorbidities. For the sake of discussion, I have uh, divided the comorbidities into infectious and non-infectious comorbidities. Among infections, one can have uh, all sorts of infections like bacteria, fungal, viral, and others. Uh, I'll be discussing some points regarding the HIV and COVID-19 co-infection with tuberculosis. Among non-infectious comorbidities, one can have anything and everything but, uh, under the sun. Uh, all the immune systems can have their usual diseases ranging from bronchial asthma, occupational lung diseases, aspergilloma, and cardiovascular system. One can have ischemic heart diseases, valvular heart diseases, all sorts of arrhythmias, all sorts of di digestive problems, renal problems. Uh, reproductive problems, endocrine problems, neurological problems, and even uh, psychiatric, hematological, and uh, nutrition related problems are common and may be observed co to be coexisting with uh, any patient of tuberculosis. So, uh, my major part of the talk will be focused on uh, tuberculosis and HIV co infection. I prefer to call these as the devil and the co devil. Uh, Dr. Sumit, sorry to interrupt. Can you please be a little more louder? So it will be. Yeah, okay. Thank so uh, I prefer to call them uh, the devil and the co devil. Uh, so, that, uh, just in fact, 
people living with hiv aids are at eight times higher risk of getting tuberculosis compared to hiv negative individuals uh, their risk of getting tb increases at their cd4 count falls tb is the most common opportunistic infection and major cause of mortality in hiv positive patients and as hiv disease progresses there are more chances of extra pulmonary smear negative and disseminated tuberculosis uh, and it leads to delayed diagnosis as well around 5 5% of new tb cases in india they come out to be hiv positive which translates to a whooping 1 lakh patients a year so that is the reason uh, we need to focus our uh, programmatic management and we need to merge uh, these two programs so that both hiv and tb can be managed in a synchrony so coming uh, to the technological pictures we can have all sorts of pathological presentation in uh, patients with hiv and tuberculosis which can range from uh, infiltration consolidation cavities fibrosis lymphadenopathy biliary mottling uh, even patients that have uh, effusions and the distribution can be uh, is more often uh, bilateral and mid and lower liver involvement or whole liver involvement is also common to see so i have taken some examples from the internet only uh, on the left side we see a x see a chest x ray where there are multiple uh, confluence in randomly placed nodules but uh, if you uh, have a look at the, uh, on a second look we can see that there is a little bit of a bicolor predominance on the left side we can see a chest x ray where there are large mediastinal and hilar and uh, paratracheal lymph nodes with some hairs on the left side so these are the common pictures in patients having uh, co infection of hiv and tuberculosis uh, i'll also show some some of the ct scans uh, on the left side we can see multiple randomly placed nodules of varying sizes some of them are uh, confluence and some of them are even calcified nodules on the right side we can see uh, a mediastinal window of a ct scan which is showing massive mediastinal lymphadenopathy and uh, if we have a closer look this arrow is showing to an enlarged intramammary lymph nodes so we say that uh, lymphadenopathy is a common feature in hiv positive individuals who get tuberculosis again these are the ct scans on the left side we uh, see diffuse consolidations with some breakdown uh, and uh, some tissues as well on the right as well we can see a consolidation uh, with some uh, tissue breakdown in Uh, in between and uh, various other randomly placed nodules and uh, some which are confluencing and some of them are again calcifying. So these are the common radiological pictures of HIV tuberculosis post infection. Coming to pro pro programmatic management, so since 2001, Central TB Division and National AIDS Control Organization have joined hands uh, for uh, joint management of HIV and tuberculosis. Since 2000, the routine cross referral of HIV TB was started. Since 2007, uh, routine referral of TB patients for HIV testing was started, and since 2009, intensive case finding and reporters for the reporting was started at ICTC and ART centers. So, uh, coming to diagnosis and management and the NCP and the NCP. Uh, as we all know, HIV-positive patients are considered to be a key population in uh, both NTEP and the National AIDS Control Program. And these patients, if they have symptom complex related to TB, they are offered upfront CBNAT for diagnosis of tuberculosis and to rule out transmission resistance. There is co-location of HIV and tuberculosis diagnosis facilities so that the patients don't need to uh, roam about places to get their HIV tests or even sputum examinations done. There is single window delivery of both antiretroviral and antiretroviral drugs. There is prompt initiation of ART in HIV positive individuals. So, uh, as soon as a patient is diagnosed with tuberculosis and HIV, uh, first AKT is started. And if a uh, patient uh, is was not on ART before, uh, and he progresses AKT well in say next two weeks. So uh, every attempt is made to start ART as early as possible. Usually between two weeks to two months is the time. Doctor Sumit, sorry to bother you. Uh, can you be a little more uh, loud? The audio is coming out a little bit. Can I uh, take the mic closer? Is it better now? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Okay. 
so uh, or hiv patients who are uh, coming to art center they are trained for post symptom uh, comprises of cough fever weight loss and night sweats during each visit to art center for children the symptom complex comprises of failure to thrive cough fever and history of contact to tb patient there are certain high risk groups uh, such as female sex workers men having sex with men and intravenous drug users uh, intensive case finding strategies are focused on these groups because these groups are center of hiv transmission as well as tuberculosis transmission so treatment coming to treatment part anti tubercular therapy is more or less the same for hiv and tuberculosis suppression of six months of the uh, akt for drug sensitive patients we will be discussing about drug resistant tuberculosis later on if patient is on second line uh, anti retroviral therapy then we replace the campesin with betabutin Uh, 300 mg every other day or 150 mg once a day all hiv tb patients are given uh, anti retroviral therapy and botulinum preventive therapy in addition to anti tubercular therapy as i and as i have mentioned earlier art is started after two weeks of starting akt and this is irrespective of the cd score count and irrespective of the stage of hiv disease for and in case if uh, some, uh, uh, for the studies have suggested that if in the presence of tb cases if ard is not given then mortality is very high of the order of 90% and if ard are started simultaneously uh, then there is high risk of adverse reactions so um, uh, this table is the summary of whatever i have spoken in last few minutes uh just we just need to focus on the last column which states that uh, if the patient who was not on any anti viral therapy uh, before then patient is started with treatment uh, of uh for patients who are already on anti retroviral therapy they were uh, uh, and were taken radiolidin lamivudin and nevirapine they were they are shifted to radiolidin lamivudin lamivudin and cefalidin because of interaction between uh, rifampicin and uh, nevirapine and the rationale behind uh, uh, starting early art is that since the patient is uh, having the uh, hiv and tuberculosis he is expected to have low immunity and uh, uh, his cd score counted counts are also usually low so any early initiation of art helps with uh, Uh, in your uh, 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 facilitation of immune reconstitution and early recovery. So, atino for over 300 milligram, lamivudin 300 milligram, and ethylene 600 milligram activity is the preferred ART of these patients. Uh, if the patient needs second line ART for HIV TB, then uh, the center of uh, second line ART is lamivudin. In addition to lamivudin, patient is either given atino for over red pseudovirin, stavudin, or abacavir. With a boosted PI, which may consist of atazanavir, ritonavir combination, or lovinavir, ritonavir combination. We have to again note that if patient is on any of the boosted PI, he cannot be on rifampicin uh, or rifampentin. He has to be on rifampicin. So coming uh, coming to immune reconstitution, inflammatory syndrome. Uh, once we patient, once our patient is started on AKT and AIT. Some of the patients they may uh, experience paradoxical symptoms, uh, symptoms like fever, night sweats, uh, enlargement of lymph nodes. They may show radiological worsening in the form of uh, new onset cavities, consolidation. They may have hemodynamic instability. They may have respiratory failure and even abdominal discomfort. discomfort. The mechanisms uh, are. Uh, Uh, thought to be an interplay between high antigen load and immune cell dysfunction. The high antigen load is usually because of low CD4 count, disseminated nature of an opportunistic infection, uh, paucity of inflammatory response to the opportunistic infection, as in female cryptococcal meningitis, and short duration or suboptimal treatment to opportunistic infection. So these factors uh, relate to a very high antigenic load, and since the antigenic load is very high, the Uh, the antigen presenting cells and the macrophages they uh, present this high antigenic load to the immune uh, immune system, and this in turn relates to a very high pro-inflammatory cytokine activity. It is also thought that there is detectable or delayed regulatory responses also, which uh, do not stop these high cytokine uh, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine activity to happen. So these lead to uh, this uh, lead to symptoms of high risk. Uh, most
most of the cases of pirates are given by the high to moderate cases, they may be self-limiting or and uh, the symptoms may be controlled by just symptomatic treatment uh, like NSAID and stuff. But certain severe cases they do require uh, intensive systemic steroid therapy or even uh, temporary withholding, temporary withholding the antiretroviral therapy. So Wolfram oxygen prophylaxis therapy is also very important. Wolfram oxygen is the almost of broad spectrum antibiotic. It is given to uh, prevent various infection, majorly focusing on the uh, pneumocystis and pneumonia. The dose is 950 milligrams once a day in adults. And in children, it has it, it is given as per weight bands. It can be given to pregnant patients as well, uh, irrespective of gestational age. Uh, this is the recent change in the guidelines. And it can be given with AKT and ART. So earlier, there used to be concerned because of the the, the protramoxazole being the folate uh, uh, metabolized and all those things. But now these uh, concerns have been ruled out. Uh, the only current contraindication to CPT are CPT deficient and history, documented history of serial drug allergy to sulfur cell models. Uh, these are the weight bands we need to only to mug up these weight bands for children for CPT. Uh, now, tuberculosis preventive therapy. This is the recent update which has come since July 2021 in National Tuberculosis Elimination Program. Uh, the rationale behind preventive tuberculosis therapy is. Uh, that risk of PB infection increases by 16 to 21 times uh, in case of HIV uh, co infection with or without ART. And uh, the risk of development of uh, TB after uh, tuberculosis preventive therapy decreases by approximately 90% among uh, people living with HIV. Uh, testing of uh, tuberculosis infection by uh, tuberculosis skin test or even IGRA is not a uh, mandatory requirement for initiating TPT, but it is desirable. And people living with HIV who are on ART, they are also given TPT. Uh, so, children who are, who are exposed to HIV positive mothers, uh, and the, if the mother is on negative, then children are usually able to assist HIV. So, this is the protocol which is being followed by NCP, uh, NCAP for. Uh, Rolling out uh, for uh, management of tuberculosis from prophylaxis therapy, uh, which contains of any symptoms or if the patient is having any of the symptom complex for tuberculosis, it is investigated for active tuberculosis. And if an active severe tuberculosis is sufficiently ruled out by uh, X ray and sputum examination, then and if there are no contraindications for preventive treatment, then the patient is given uh, tuberculosis preventive therapy. There are two main regimes which we need to know. Uh, one is 6H regime, where the patient is given daily isoniazid. Uh, dose is 5 mg per kilogram per day for adults, and for children less than 10 years, the dose is 10 mg per kilogram per day. For uh, another regime is 3HP regime, where in weekly uh, isoniazid and rifampentin are given. Uh, for adults, the dose is uh, 900 mg of isoniazid and 900 mg of rifampentin. It is given for 12 weeks. And for children, the doses uh, ranges from 300 mg to 700 mg of isoniazid and around uh, 300 to 750 mg of rifampentin per week. So one has to keep in mind that these high doses are not daily doses, these are weekly doses. So, uh, CPT uh, is also indicated for all those HIV patients, that is the children or adults who have already uh, successfully completed their treatment disease. And uh, one, uh, one is very sure that they are microbiologically negative of tuberculosis. They are given a course of tuberculosis preventive therapy as well. The transmission or repentant CPT regimens are not combined with the proteas and emitters and degeneration because of their. Uh, and if infant is of uh, HIV exposed, mother is uh, exposed, uh, and mother is on maybe the same as the testing as referred, four R and PSP regimes are not given again. These six supplementation is also very important as uh, especially HIV positive patients, they are at increased risk of uh, peripheral neuropathy. So in uh, PL HIV, the dose of uh, paradoxin is 50 milligrams per day. HIV and drug resistance uh, TB cases, uh, again, uh, PLHIV are key population, so upfront uh, CV not just uh, offered to these patients. 
beta series is used in the, this portion in the patient who are on the pathogen or uh, lopinavir is on the function combination with the drug interaction and uh, shear toxicity. Uh, initiation of the anti retrovirus therapy, protamoxifer prophylaxis uh, therapy, and other prophylaxis are similar uh, in drug resistant TB cases as in drug sensitive TB patients with HIV. And uh, PLHIV needs more frequent uh, monitoring of uh, LFTs and electrolytes uh, because of shared toxicity. So, there are a lot of uh, shared toxicities in. Uh, uh, between uh, antitubercular and antiretroviral drugs, we can see here uh, side effects like peripheral neuropathy, GI intolerance, patotoxicity, rash, neuropsychiatric side effects, and even nephrotoxicity. They are caused by both some of the antitubercular antitubercular drugs and some of the antiretroviral drugs. So, if any TB HIV patient is having any of these side effects, one should be very careful and one should carefully rule out. Whether it's a culprit antitubercular drug or whether it's a culprit is an antiretroviral drug. So, a few words about TB and COVID 19 pandemic. Uh, COVID 19 pandemic hit our country in 2020, and because of uh, the lockdown which happened in that year, the, the TB case reporting took a major hit uh, in that year. And the uh, and death resources were diverted to the management of. Uh, this pandemic, so public health access, access to tuberculosis diagnosis, and availability of drugs was also hampered to some extent. Uh, studies have showed that tuberculosis is associated with a 2.1 fold increased risk of severe COVID 19 disease. So, this is the reason that the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare had uh, uh, advised a bi directional screening of tuberculosis and COVID 19 in patients having any of these two diseases. And uh, in our private practice, we have seen that a number of uh, patients got incidentally diagnosed with tuberculosis who were otherwise being uh, radiologically evaluated for severity of COVID 19. So, treat, there are again some treatment concerns. Temdesivir is going to cause uh, transaminitis as does uh, many of the tuberculosis drugs. Teriviravir uh, causes hyperuricemia as does our favorite pyrazinamitis. And if the patient is given steroids or biologicals, uh, for severe COVID-19 leads to disease uh, immunity and may clear up undiagnosed or uh, subclinical tuberculosis infection. Uh, diabetes and tuberculosis. So diabetes is another epidemic which is coming up in India. India has second largest number of diabetes in the world. Both diabetes and tuberculosis, they, they are the diseases which can have delayed diagnosis and they relate and this relates to poorer outcomes. Diabetes relates to Culture, uh, delays, culture conversion and respiratory conversion. So, one has to be uh, very careful by switching the patient from intensive phase to continuation phase without uh, this. This should not be done in any patient without being very sure that the patient has been microbiologically converted. So, because it can lead to drug resistance. Um, so, TB and diabetes patients are uh, more at increased risk of death and relapse. So, that is why. Uh, even the national program for uh, cardiovascular cancer and stroke and cerebrovascular diseases and NTEP, they have uh, joined hands for uh, management of these diseases. Diabetics are at increased risk of development ADD, ADD induced uh, side effects such as peripheral neuropathy, nephropathy, and septic neuritis. And if a diabetic patient is on beta three, more frequent cardiac evaluation is required to pick up an, uh, any early duty uh, prolongation. Uh, coming to TB, TB and nutritional issues, so malnutrition and malnutrition, these issues are also very common in our uh, settings. Uh, low BMI and lack, and lack of adequate care during treatment should be, which relates to the tuberculosis of TB relapse and death. So, uh, the recommendation is uh, a good nutri initial nutritional assessment of TB patient has to be done and it has to be followed up during the follow up visit. Uh, overall counseling of a uh, TB uh, patient should include a good diet and diet advice. And if any patient has severe and good malnutrition, it has to be managed according to uh, local and uh, guidelines. Patients with moderate adverse nutrition who fail to regain their uh, normal BMI at the end of two months of treatment uh, in these patients, we need to check for adherence and to rule out comorbidity, not to forget that there, there could be drug resistance cases as well. Uh, special categories of TB patients.
patients who have special nutritional requirements that we can less than five years in pregnancy and with infancy disease. So micronutrient supplementation is also important in pregnancy, like iron, folic acid, uh, minerals, vitamins, etc. So substance abuse is another common issue with 30 percent of the patients. Most commonly used the uh, is tobacco. India is the second largest consumer and third largest producer of tobacco in the world. So nearly 1 million Indians die from tobacco use every year. It can be because of cancer, it can be because of stupid, it can be because of any disease. Uh, there was a survey done in 2010, the Global Adult Tobacco Survey, which revealed that there, are, uh, there, were, there were around 275 million adult tobacco users in India at that point in time. And uh, I want to point it out, point out here that this survey was done 12 years back. So uh, we have not seen a uh, situation improving in these 12 years or so. Uh, smokeless tobacco is almost as twice uh, commonly used in India as compared to smoking tobacco. And uh, as we know that tobacco smoke is uh, consistent of certain toxic chemicals which uh, which lead to dissolvence in from the surface and hampers bronchial immunity and predisposes the tobacco user to various infections which may include tuberculosis as well. So TB tobacco association uh, of TB tests are associated with the use of tobacco and prevalence and mortality both are around three to four times higher among never smokers as compared to never smokers. Smoking contributes to half of the male deaths in the uh, 25 to 69 years age So again, uh, exposure to tobacco uh, smoke has found to increase the risk of TB infection. It has found to increase the risk of TB relapse. It has found to affect sputum's near culture conversion and outcome of tuberculosis. It has found to increase tuberculosis mortality and drug resistance. So uh, we have to follow this well known 5A 5R strategy to any TB patient who consumes and who is exposed to tobacco in any form. Advise, assess, assist, and arrange. Uh, those who are not willing for quitting consumption, uh, then uh, they are candidates for 5R uh, strategy, which consists of explaining relevance, risk, and report, tackling their port blocks, and repeat these exercises at each visit. So, coming to alcoholism, again, alcoholism is also rampant, and alcoholism also increases the general immunity of the patient and predisposes the patient to tuberculosis. Uh, Alcoholism also causes malnutrition and liver disease, which have their own effects on immunity and which uh, independently predispose the patient to active tuberculosis disease. There are certain social economic factors also in play. There are certain shared toxicities like uh, hepatotoxicity and gastritis between alcohol and antitubercular drugs. European Union has highest alcohol related TB mortality despite having lowest TB mortality in the world. So, some, uh, a little something we'll share about TB and occupational lung diseases. So, uh, there are uh, two on crushing units, workers and local residents uh, living around that area, they are exposed to high levels of silica. So, increased morbidity and mortality rates are uh, seen among these people. Uh, these people can have silicosis, lung cancer, and they may have other, uh, other lung diseases as well. They are uh, having increased risk of tuberculosis, and uh, there are other occupations like coal uh, mining and other mineral mining, tobacco or PPD rolling, and carpet cleaning. These all uh, occupations are uh, definitely related to increased risk and transmission of tuberculosis. So, I have just taken this extract from internet, which is shown bilateral consolidation bilateral uh, modules uh, and reticulation and the thin walled uh, cavity in left lower zone this patient was exposed to uh, silica uh, this is a CT scan of uh, a case of silica tuberculosis which is showing a consolidation with cavitation on the right side uh, now coming to TB and renal failure renal failure patients are uh, again predisposed to have uh, or to having tuberculosis and various infections because of again uh, immunity. So, and, and this uh, uh, observation is augmented in transplant recipients because they are uh, they, uh, they are uh, having higher than anything else. So, uh, most of the 
Cetrus means the Rathamphacin, Isonia, Bred, Pyrazinamide, Moxifloxacin, Vedaculin, Zorobazimine, and Lidinazolid. They can be given in renal failure patients most of the time. Uh, it's just that for pyrazinamide, uh, we need to adjust the dose if the reaction clearance is less than 30 ml per minute or the patient is on hemodialysis. Ethambutol has to be avoided as much as possible, more so if the reaction clearance is less than 30 uh, because it definitely increases the risk of ocular toxicity if given to renal failure patients. Uh, amino glycoside and capsaicin they also uh, best be, uh, are best be avoided. But in dire emergency, we need to use them. We, uh, we need to use them with caution, and uh, we need to make sure that the uh, dose of internal interval is increased so much so that we achieve undetectable plasma drug levels before each dose. So again, that is very difficult to uh, do in a peripheral setting. But yeah, it's, uh, we do have resources. We should always do plasma drug levels uh, in these cases. Coming to a little uh, some information about the tube of glucose and liver disease. Again, uh, the glucose and liver failure patients have 14 fold increased risk of tube of glucose because of again immune dysfunction. Uh, so, for guiding anti tubercular uh, therapy in this patient, we need to look at their CTP score. If the CTP score is less than equal to, or equal to 7 and the liver disease is stable, that patient can be put on a regimen with two potential, potentially hepatotoxic drugs. Therein, we should avoid pyrazinamide uh, as much as possible, uh, but it is not absolutely contraindicated. If the CTP score is between 8 to 10 and liver disease is advanced, then the uh, uh, patient has to be put on a regimen containing of just one hepatotoxic drug, wherein the narcosin is prefer preferred over isoni acid. Uh, here, pyrazinamide is absolutely contraindicated. And contraindicated. And if the CTP score is more than or equal to 11 and the liver disease is very advanced, so in these cases, no potentially hepatotoxic drugs may be used. These are examples of certain regimens which can be used in these patients for two hepatotoxic drug regimen. The regimen is nine months of isolated and or maybe uh, we can give two months of streptomycin isomiazid and ethambutol ethambutin followed by six months of isomiazid and ethambutin. Uh, the patient can be put on six to nine months of ethambutin pyrazinamide and ethambutol alone. If we have to give one hepatotoxic drug regimen, then it can, uh, we can put the charge of the patient with two months of isomiazid, ethambutol and streptomycin. Streptomycin can be stopped after two months. And uh, total uh, duration of treatment is 12 months. If uh, we have to put the patient on the containing no hepatotoxic drug regimen, then the duration of treatment has to be at least 18 or maybe up to 24 months. And uh, the drugs which can be used are ethambutol, zimolone, cyclosidine, and some of the injectables. So, take other points from uh, my talk are TB can be complicated by many comorbidities. HIV and diabetes are so common commonplace diseases that they require a multifaceted approach to. Uh, these uh, to deal with these comorbid in HIV patients, and patients may have overlapping ADR because of uh, many drugs, and comorbidities increase the burden of tuberculosis and lead to poor outcomes. I thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. It was indeed an honor to listen to you. And now I request Dr. Nikhil Sarandha to take the platform and share the case presentations related to TB and its comorbidities. Yes. Am I audible, Shubhi? Yes, sir, you're audible. Yeah, okay. I'm not uh, able to share my screen. I think Dr. Mm -hmm. Sumit will have one. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Sumit, if you could unshare the screen. I think I have stopped the screen here. Is my screen still visible? Yes, your screen is still visible. Um, Ritima, you uh, should be, you can do one thing. You can share your screen so so screen will be forced. Then you stop share. Yeah. Uh, you would be able to share now. Let me see.
a moment, please. Awesome. Yeah, is my screen visible? Not yet, sir. Um, okay. Can I send it to you? Uh, yeah, sure, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, Dr. Sumit, by the meantime, uh, I would like to ask you regarding uh, TB and its comorbidities. So, as per your clinical expertise, so uh, how frequent it is to uh, come around such cases that are uh, being uh, hampered by the comorbidities as related to the treatment? I think that in uh, present, uh, however, yeah. So I think in the current scenario, it is very rare to find a pure TB care. Uh, so comorbidities are more of a norm than an exception. So most of the TB patients, they do have one or the other comorbidities with, uh, in, in addition to tuberculosis. Yeah, HIV patients and all because of aggressive uh, government deaths, they are more, more seen in the uh, government settings. They patients typically don't uh, turn up to our private clinic. But yeah, in uh, private uh, practice, we do see HIV with diabetes. Uh, sorry, tuberculosis with diabetes. We do see tuberculosis with uh, COVID. Then we can see tuberculosis with other bacterial infection. We can see tuberculosis with cardiac issues. All these uh, things are pretty much common. Or, uh, renal failure, uh, liver failure, these patients are very common in private practice. Uh, thank you, sir. So, by the meantime, I'm sharing Dr. Nicholas' presentation. Please let me, let me know if it is visible. It's visible. Yeah. So, can we start? Yes, sir. Please let me know when to move forward. Yeah, I will. So... Thank you, everybody. And at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Shobhi, Dr. Ridhima, Dr. Mayuri, and my colleague, Dr. Sumit, and the entire team of Med Learning Hub for inviting me to be here. Now, my colleague, Dr. Sumit, has taken you along very nicely. You see on uh, an elaborate presentation about the commonly used, you see, anti-TB drugs, the different presentations of TB, and the commonly encountered comorbidities which we deal with when we are dealing with uh, different cases of tuberculosis. So I'm going to be very brief in my presentation. I'm going to take you through an unusual case. So uh, next slide. Yeah. So friends, uh, what is the most rapid test to diagnose TB? Is it, you see on the left, you have your sputum AFB smear. In the middle, you have your cartridge-based CVNAT for your gene expert. And finally, you have the good old chest X-ray. You see, I would say next that it is ultimately the chest X-ray because nowadays you have digital X-rays. A CBNAT report will take you minimum two hours, 45 minutes. A sputum AFB smear will take at least an hour to get both samples and then stain and the slides. The good old chest X-ray with the uh, digital platform, you can get it in just 10 minutes, but this will give you a good presumptive diagnosis of TB. For decades, you see, prior to NTEP, which we previously called RNTCP, and then and prior to that NTCP also, they used mass miniature nat radiography, which was a form of chest X-ray. Then came your sputum AFB smear, and since the last two decades, we have had the advent of gene expert or CBNAT. Chest X-ray remains the first investigation of choice in pulmonary or plural disease, and even in extra pulmonary disease, you have to rule out coexisting primary complexes or pulmonary lesions. So, a chest X-ray is important even in extra pulmonary disease also. Next, 
So when it comes to diagnosis of tuberculosis, you have direct tests which detect the presence of mycobacterial infection in the body or indirect tests which measure the body's response to mycobacterial infection. Next. So amongst these tests, you have microscopy where you directly observe the acid pass bacillus, that is mycobacterium tuberculosis by Nielsen and modified stains, fluorescent microscopy. You have your phenotypic test, which is your culture, which is a solid and liquid. You have genotypic tests, which are your molecular techniques like your CBNAT, your gene expert, your line probe assay, now whole genome sequencing and others. Next. So culture is, was, and remains the gold standard for diagnosis of tuberculosis. You have the solid, which takes more time, and the liquid also, which is a bit faster. Next. Then you see in 2008, the World Health Organization endorsed the CBNAT or the expert MTB report. It's also called the gene expert, which is a simple point of care test, which will give you two things. One is the diagnosis of MTB infection. And secondly, the presence of rifampicin resistance if MTB infection is detected. The turnabout time for this is roughly two hours, but because of the load, it takes about a day for the report to come in hand. Next. Yeah. Then we have the line probe assay, which identifies the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. It detects mutations associated with resistance to INH, to rifampicin, that is the first line LPA. And you have now the second line LPA, which also detects fluoroquinolone resistance and second line injectables. Line probe assays have good sensitivity and specificity when culture isolates are used. Next. So ultimately, culture is the gold standard, but it takes time ultimately all said and done. And nowadays we don't have that much time. We are trying to end TB by 2025 and solve 2022. So we now rely more on the molecular methods. So what do these molecular methods do? They detect the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis in specimen. They identify the mycobacterial species as mycobacterium tuberculosis. And they also identify drug resistance or sensitivity so that you can start an appropriate regimen of anti-TB drugs. Next. So in short, about the gold standard, that is culture, what are its advantages? It provides specific standardized DST for individualized treatment possible. It differentiates mycobacterium tuberculosis from non tubercular mycobacteria. And this is important because you see DST without speciation results in inappropriate therapy. It is the most sensitive and specific test even for extra pulmonary samples. And you get culture conversion with successful therapy. Therefore, it is a useful monitoring tool. About the disadvantages, it's time consuming, terribly time consuming. And I told you when we are dealing with the case of TB, we don't have that much time in hand. Cultures are expensive. Cultures are prone to contamination, particularly liquid cultures. And you have your biosafety hazards, that is your aerosol generation, which are more with your liquid cultures. Next. Then you have the gene expert, you see. Advantages of gene expert are that it will give you a diagnosis of RIF resistance, which is a surrogate marker for MDRT. It will quantify your mycobacterium tuberculosis load as very high, high, intermediate, or low. It has the least biohazard risk of all the genotypic tests, and it has good sensitivity for both smear positive, smear negative, as well as extra pulmonary samples. But the disadvantages are being a genotypic test, it remains false positive in patients who have completed treatment. And the diagnostic accuracy is critically dependent on cycle threshold values for the RPOB gene, which means that in, you know, when the load is detected as very low or low, the test is not that reliable. Next. The line probe assay. Advantages are that it helps you give a diagnosis of MNXTRTB or pre-XTRTB also, and there is potential for improved yield of results relative to culture. But there is a risk of DNA cross-contamination. The test may fail if PCR inhibitors such as blood are present in the sample, whether it is putum or an extra pulmonary sample, and there is a limited number of drugs for which the line probe assay is standardized. Next. So ultimately, when you look at the sensitivity of diagnostic tests for TB, the most sensitive test is your midget or your liquid culture, followed by CBNAT next, and then your line probe assay. So ultimately, yeah, next, next. Yeah, so all I want to tell you is that today we are relying on molecular methods. They are a standard of diagnosis and treatment, no doubt. But there is variable sensitivity in extrapulmonary disease, smear negative pulmonary disease, TB, HIV, co-infection, pediatric tuberculosis. And therefore, in some cases, they cannot 
he recommended to replace conventional methods entirely next and i'm going to show uh, demonstrate this by the case which i'm discussing with all of you so this is the case finally a 44 year old male resident of mulund mumbai presented to a chest clinic of one of the major municipal hospitals of mumbai in feb 2014 his complaints were chronic cough for 11 months progressively increasing shortness of breath for 10 months cough was not associated with expectation of hemoptysis and there was no aggravating or relieving factor for cough and breathlessness there was no chest pain wheezing cold fever or weight loss and sleep appetite bulb blood habits were normal now prior to presentation the patient had visited two general physicians for his complaints he had received symptomatic treatment for the cough and breathlessness but no definitive diagnosis and why a definitive diagnosis is important i'll come to that also next So when we took the history, past history did not reveal any major illness or disease, and the contact history was insignificant. The patient did not have any addictions. He was a non-smoker and did not consume alcohol. On examination, his vital signs were stable. Digital clubbing was present, and these things are important. I'll tell you why as I progress towards the case. The chest examination was unremarkable except for a few fractures heard bilaterally, which you would get in any chronic lung disease. Next. yeah so first thing that we always do is take a chest x ray i told you chest x ray is important even when you are looking at extra pulmonary tb so the chest radiograph reveals some bilateral micronodular shadows in the lung field and for those of you who are good at reading x ray please take a good look at the x ray here you would get a clue as to the diagnosis what is the comorbidity that is associated with tb over here hemogram was normal except for a mildly elevated esr which again will happen in any chronic infection such as tb the sputum smear for afb which was a standard then that time in 2014 remember this is 2014 8 years ago okay was negative serology was non reactive for retroviral disease and hepatitis so based on the above evaluation the patient was diagnosed as a new case of smear negative pulmonary tuberculosis and started on your usual you know anti tubercular therapy of inh rifampicin pyrazinamide and thambutol now was this right perhaps yes because ultimately the patient was a case of tuberculosis and how we'll see next yeah however the patient symptoms were not relieved even after 2 months you know at this time he noticed reduction in his weight and appetite followed by the appearance of fever which is a new symptom he came for a second opinion to us in may 2014 on further questioning you know he took a good history it was revealed that he works in a chakki or a flour mill for more than 30 years his father also used to work in the same chakki and he would often assist his father since a very young age so an examination more or less the same digital clubbing some bronchial breath sounds some scattered crackles next again hemogram is unremarkable serum creatinine liver function blood sugars tsh total ig were normal ecg and 2d echo did not reveal any abnormalities we again sent a sputum smear for afb cb nat which is your gene expert and a first line line probe assay so you know again all these things were negative spirometry revealed some mild obstruction with bronchodilator reversibility next So this is the chest X-ray, and again I'm highlighting. Those of you who are good at reading X-rays can again take a look. You see, again chest X-ray received revealed some small micronodular shadows in the right lung and left lower zone, and excel calcification of the left hilar node. So now I think the diagnosis becomes a little clear. So followed by a CT, you know, we did a CT also just to get a better look at what is happening inside the lungs. so you got patchy consolidation small branching or tree in bud opacities in the posterior segment of the right upper and pycle segment of the right lower lobe adjoining fibrosis and fraction bronchial cases again with some fibrinodal opacities in the right upper and right middle lobe right lower lobe and a pycle segment of the left lower lobe enlarged and calcified left hilar prevascular para preacal and preacal nodes next so you see we also wanted to do a bronchoscopy because till now we have just a presumptive diagnosis of tb and something else which i'll come to for a definitive diagnosis of tb please understand you need either a sputum smear microscopy okay you need either a gene expert or an lpa positive or 
other genotypic tests like your genome sequencing or your culture or if you are not able to get anything by a microbiological diagnosis then you must have a pathological diagnosis where you will see the pathognomic lesions of tb such as cages necrosis epithelial cell granulomas langans giles and etc so we are chest specialists we always want to go for a definitive diagnosis so the fiber optic bronchoscopy was advised the patient consented to it it was performed and all aseptic precautions with local anesthesia and conscious sedation now the ball that is the bronchoalveolar lavage this finally revealed afd in smear ran strain and bacterial cultures were negative a gene expert or cbnat of the ball was also sent and that detected mycobacterium tuberculosis with medium load and rifampicin resistance and we also sent this ball you see for a full culture with drug susceptibility testing to a nationally accredited reference lab next so you see what you have now you have you see tuberculosis that is one and the excel calcification with the history of working in a chakki so ultimately this is a case of silico tuberculosis and why this is important because occupational lung diseases are also a comorbidity which we often forget we look at diabetes we look at hiv we look at liver and kidney disease but we often forget to see where the patient is working occupation is also important after all tb is a socio economic disease as well not just an infection so you see excel calcification is very commonly associated with silicosis uh, but can also be seen in certain other lung conditions such as sarcoidosis hodgkin's lymphoma particularly post radiotherapy amyloidosis some fungal infections like blastomycosis and histoplasmosis which are very rare in our country and very very rarely in scleroderma next so this was seen on the x ray and those who would have seen the x ray in the beginning would have got this right so now finally you have a definitive diagnosis so all this while patient has been treated empirically you know you have a definitive diagnosis now of pulmonary silico tuberculosis with rifampicin resistance so how does this uh, how did silicosis come you see in this patient so ultimately when these all, all those who work in a grinding or chakki mill the source of silica particles in the flour mill workers is the agra stone it is a reddish stone which has a very high silica content and is used to chisel the large grinder in the mill and during this procedure a significant amount of silica dust is generated and remember i told you the patient has been working for more than 30 years not wearing a mask probably so that is why he has been exposed to this so the patient has been informed and counseled about the diagnosis next but definitive diagnosis by itself is not enough you have to give definitive treatment you see this is the agra stone which i spoke about earlier next yeah so you know you have to treat not just the tb tb you will treat but you also have to treat the underlying lung disease so you have to relieve the patient symptoms of cough and breathlessness for that you have to give long acting bronchodilators and corticosteroid by inhalers okay that is for the silicosis for the obstructive airway disease which is a component of silicosis and of course you have uh, you have mtb with uh, rifampicin resistance so you will start an appropriate anti tb regimen that time the standard of care was this regimen you of lock the nitronamide dimethyl pyrazinamide cyclosine and tanamycin weight adjusted with regular follow up but have we forgotten something yes we are just treating as a case of silico tb with rif resistance and why i said previously that ultimately your genotypic tests are not the gold standard i'm coming to that now next yeah so ultimately your drug susceptibility testing is was and will, will remain the gold standard only problem it takes time so you know we got the cdst reports of the ball at 6 weeks and this revealed extensively drug resistant or xdr tb with the isolate showing resistance to isoniazid and rifampicil ethambutol pyrazinamide streptomycin and canamycin amikacin and ofloxacin and susceptibility to moxifloxacin clopazamine nitronamide paramino salicylate cyclosine clarithromycin and capriomycin so ultimately what is good here is that you have a regimen of 7 to 8 drugs which you can give what is bad is you have wasted two months not you have wasted but ultimately time has gone by and the patient has suffered so you have to change the treatment regimen which we did to a more individualized one consisting of all drugs which are sensitive remember that time bedaquiline was not available under access okay today the regimen would be completely different 
So we gave moxifloxacin, ethionamide, cyclosine, paraminosalicylate, clarithromycin, clofazamine, and captiomycin. Now this patient is highly dependent on his occupation. Tuberculosis, I told you, is a socioeconomic disease as well. You can't just advise a, pa a patient who's been working for 30, 40 years in one occupation to change it overnight. It's dependent. He is dependent on it for his livelihood. So ultimately, we told him you can continue. You can continue. You must continue the treatment with inhalers. You have to use personal protective measures like wearing a mask over the nose and mouth and all times while working in the flower mill. Next. And our plan of treatment also was explained to the patient. See, it is not important only to give the patient a diagnosis. That is there. But you also have to explain what you're going to do, how you're going to treat, what is the prognosis ultimately, how long it will take. Okay, so first and foremost, anti-TB treatment, then your inhaler therapy with bronchodilators and corticosteroids. You have to minimize further exposure by wearing a simple mask. Vaccination with seasonal influenza and polyvalent pneumococcal vaccine. And during follow-up, you have to assess periodically. Clinical parameters at every visit and lung function and exercise tolerance, you can assess every three to six months. Next. Yeah. So let's see how the patient responded. So ultimately, what is important in any case, you know, TB or even otherwise, is relief of the patient's symptoms. Finally, Relief of his dyspnea and cough, followed by resolution of his fever, improvement and his appetite, and a marginal weight gain within a month. We monitored the patient with hemograms, blood tests like creatinine, liver function, DSH every month, and chest radiographs every three months. See, this is extensive lung disease, so the chest X-ray will not improve immediately. Okay. At six months, we repeated a CT scan of the chest, and this revealed significant clearance of the consolidation in the right upper and lower lobes. Persistence of the calcified lymph nodes and traction bronchiectasis as described earlier. The lung function was stable. Putum mycobacterial culture at six months was negative. So at six months, what we did is we discontinued the injectable. Okay, we continued all the other oral drugs for another 18 months, and we again monitored similarly with the same parameters: test X-ray every three months, and then hemogram creatinine, TSH, LFT, which were all normal. Spirometry revealed after a year showed that lung function parameters were stable. That is to say, FEV1, FEC did not decline significantly. Next. So ultimately, all is well, friends. That ends well. You know, at the end of two years of treatment, his last sputum mycobacterial culture was negative. HRCT is also good. Clearance of the consolidation and persistence of some old fibrotic lesions and calcified lymph nodes. We stopped the anti-tubercular drug therapy. We advised him to continue inhaler therapy with protective measures and again, get himself vaccinated, you see, uh, with seasonal influenza vaccine. The patient continues to take inhaler therapy regularly, follows every six months, is stable, symptom-free, and without other comorbidities since the last five years. Next. So in brief, you know, I want to discuss the importance of silicosis. In tuberculosis. So radiologically, there is a close resemblance between silicosis and miliary tuberculosis. How we will differentiate the size of nodules, the overall translucency is more in silicosis. And miliary tuberculosis will have more of toxic clinical manifestations like fever and other things. Next. So what is silicosis in short? You see, silicosis is a group of lung disorders caused by inhalation, retention, and pulmonary reaction to silica or silicon dioxide particles. Silica contributes 28% of the Earth's crust, and it, ex and it exists as metallic compounds in rock, clay, and sand. You know, it, you have two types, the crystalline silica and the amorphous, which is harmless. The crystalline silica causes disease, okay? 3 million workers in India are at risk, according to the National Institute of Occupational Health. And keep in mind the development and progression of silicosis can occur even after the exposure to silica has stopped. In our case, the exposure source was the Agra stone. Next. So silicosis in India was first described by Captain and Burden and workers at the Kolar Gold Field in Mysore in 1940s. Now, that time it was benign disease as the silica dust was not fibrogenic. There was just some heavy obstruction. Then we had occasional case reports followed by Sikand and Mamra and Stone patients, Banerjee and Roy and Iron and Steel workers, Vishwanathan and Ordnance factories, 
Vera and Malik and Emery Polish workers. All these are industries which are associated with silicosis. Okay, Syed and Godasara and pottery and slate pencil workers, Shivasa and Gupta and glass panel workers, and by the National Institute of Occupational Health in the quartz industry. Dr. Banerjee was the first in India to write an article on pneumoconiosis and its relation to tuberculosis in 1951. Next. The NIOH surveys relieve, revealed that P silica levels for their invespirable dust, more than half the high exposure sites. And again, more than half of the workers at high exposure sites suffered from silicosis, a very high incidence as compared to other countries. The average duration of exposure before development of disease was 10 to 12 years. 18% developed massive fibrosis and 22% died within 16 months of diagnosis. You also have something called environmental non-occupational silicosis reported in high altitude villages of central Ladakh by Norbu and Angchup in 1991. You know how these residents get exposed. They are exposed to dust storms that contain silica particles. So it becomes again an occupational, it becomes a non-occupational exposure. Next. So this is the prevalence of silicosis in different industries. I'll not go into details. Keep in mind that in stone cutters, grinders, slate pencil workers, mica and agate miners workers, the incidence is very high. Next. So how does the silicosis develops? You see, once silica particles are inhaled, they are deposited in the distal airways and alveoli. They interact with malvular macrophages. The macrophages migrate to the interstitium lymphatics and regional lymph nodes, where they start releasing proteolytic enzymes and cause injury to the underlying lung tissue by fibroblast growth factor into leukil 1, TNF alpha, which are all your pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then you have chemotaxon neutrophils and T lymphocytes and production of reactive oxygen radicals. So you have, you see the acute form, which is, which presents like an ARDS with type two pneumocytes, pleasure and alveolar causes, and you have chronic, which gives you the silicosis and the silicotic nodules and hyalization and fibrosis. Next. Yeah, so you have the acute form, which is very, very rare. This is often caused by a very high intense exposure and disease develops within a few months, two years. The more common form is the uh, chronic form, which you have, where you have low to moderate exposure for more than 20 years, mainly a chronic occupational exposure like a patient. You have more of quiescent fibrosis in the chronic phase, unlike the inflammation, which is seen in the acute phase. And you have simple, where you have silicotic nodules and you have the complicated silicosis where you have progressive massive fibrosis lesions seen on the CT scan or X-ray, which are more than two centimeters necrosis and cavitation. In between, you have something of a hybrid form, which is called the accelerated form, which can take five to 10 years to develop after the exposure. And this is more common in patients with underlying connective tissue disorders like lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis. Next. So uncomplicated chronic silicosis is the commonest form we see. It may be asymptomatic for many, many years ex in spite of extensive radiological lesions on the chest X-ray. Progressively, the patient will develop dyspnea on exertion and chronic cough like our patient did. Sputum production may or may not be there. Depends on whether the patient is a smoker and whether he has bronchitis or not. So what, is, what are the pointers that will, you see, give you an indication that this is tuberculosis also? Symptoms of tuberculosis, fever, chest pain, expectoration, hemoptysis, weight loss, all these indicate tuberculosis. So acute silicosis, unlike the chronic form, will present like an ARDS with rapidly progressive dyspnea and respiratory failure, chest pain, fever, weight loss, and fatigue. There are complications of silicosis. Fibrosis is one, tuberculosis, which we are discussing, any other infection because the lung is diseased, so pneumonia, fungal infections, which we call silicomycosis, scar carcinoma, scar emphysema, pneumothorax, respiratory failure, pulmonary hypertension, and call pulmonary. Next. So ultimately, you diagnose silicosis by a good occupational history. You have to prove that there is exposure to a substantial or significant amount of respirable silica particles in the ambient environment. And you have to have radiological evidence of disease, which can be silicotic nodules, which can be involvement of hyaluromediational lymph nodes with or without XL calcification, 
and in advanced disease you have the pmf or progressive massive fibrosis lesion which are formed in several telecortic nodules coalesce to form a larger lesion which is usually 2 cm or more in size and is present at the lung, lung apices there's volume loss of the upper lobe with upward displacements of mediastinal and ilar structures compensatory hyperinflation in the contralateral lung next so when you do spirometry sometimes you may not get a specific pattern of impairment and if the lung function may even be normal at times spirometry is more useful for evaluation than diagnosis but it is very important in the minors and for occupational history because it's a, it becomes more or less medical legal to diagnose that this is a case because there is compensation under the workmen's compensation act if you develop a case of silicosis but you have an accelerated the rate of decline of lung function in smokers usually we don't have to do bronchoscopy or lung biopsy at all okay unless you have atypical exposure history or you are suspecting some super added infection like tb or malignancy next yeah so ultimately coming back to our case tuberculosis in silicotics there is increased occurrence and risk of an entity called silico tuberculosis which our case was more severity and persistence of respiratory symptoms more of systemic and constitutional symptoms such patients tend to have more rapid progression to fibrosis cavitation pleural effusions on the chest x ray and there is delayed response to treatment thereby necessitating a longer duration of therapy next so in, what is the incidence in our country so silico tuberculosis in silicotics the incidence is 18.6% in mica workers and 6.6% in pottery and ceramic workers but the nioh found 4.8% in coal miners and 48% 10 times more in stone cutters for so the complications as a senior pneumothorax fungal infections and falls particularly in progressive massive fibrosis the standard course of your short course chemotherapy you know usually 6 months is inadequate because you have higher relapse rates to the order of more than 22% so you have to give if it is a drug sensitive case you have to give minimum 9 to 12 months of treatment with standard first line anti tb drug which is inh rifampicin pyrazinamide dimethyltryptophan the exact duration of therapy remains debatable and can change from case to case next there is no specific treatment for silicosis remember you have to treat the airway obstruction mainly however if you have acute silicosis with respiratory failure you may need to put the patient on mechanical ventilation treat as a case of ERDS sometimes lung lavage has been known to improve gas exchange you have to give bronchodilators for air flow obstruction or respiratory symptoms like cough or dyspnea irrespective of whether your lung function is abnormal or abnormal short term systemic glucocorticosteroids may improve lung function occasionally but majority of the studies that have been done show no benefit some trial drugs like inhaled aluminum citrate polyvinyl pyridine nitric oxide polybutane tetrandine etc these have been found to be useful in animal studies but ultimately none of them have found to be successful in humans you have to treat the complications such as tb okay any obstructive airway disease you have to treat it and most of our patients are also smokers so you have to advise smoking cessation for smokers those who are smokers next ultimately keep in mind ladies and gentlemen prevention is better than cure you know we have something called medical surveillance now which is a pre placement and periodic medical examination by chest x ray sputum smear and nowadays they do the gene expert also for this pre placement examination and spirometry which is your lung function then dust control measures this is important mainly for minors you have isolation of the dust generating process for example in a flour mill you know the whole thing can be covered the grinder portion so that the dust is not generated you must have good exhaust ventilation so that whatever respirable dust is there is exhausted out and is not inhaled by those who are inside you have wet abrasive techniques and humidification which make the dust settle down on the ground so it is not inhaled masks are advocated only when other dust control measures fail and they are not that effective keep in mind this may be surprising to all of you but it's the fact they are not effective in very humid or warm climates or in areas where there are high dust concentrations ultimately like in every other disease you know you have to educate the patient information about risk and exposure about tb the symptoms about tb smoking cessation also next so the key learning points ladies and gentlemen from this case of what 
you see apart from the usual comorbidities diabetes immunosuppression chronic kidney disease etc occupational exposures are often forgotten even by us as physicians sometimes we forget to take the history of occupational exposure you know they are often under recognized as comorbidities patients are commonly over diagnosed with tb and empirically treatment just uh, you see on clinical radiological grounds this subjects the patient invariably to a lot of time which is lost in establishing a definitive diagnosis keep in mind our definitive diagnosis took two months and then six weeks so three months you know we had to just spend treating like that various drug related adverse effects wastage of resources and increased morbidity and sometimes mortality also so therefore i want to say at the end of it all that we need to keep a high index of suspicion for occupational lung disease whenever we are we are dealing with any patient of tuberculosis next i want to tell you friends a word of caution no lab test is 100% full proof or 100% full proof and your phenotypic tests such as your culture and your genotypic tests like your gene expert and line probase are no exception to this rule keep in mind that when you're going by genotypic tests you are ultimately detecting the resistance molecularly and ultimately that may or may not be there all said and done therefore you require phenotypic tests like culture to identify resistance but again your culture and dst is time consuming and expensive next so what do you do you know many of us face these clinical dilemmas when we are dealing with cases of tb if the lesion for example a lymph node it persists or it enlarges you must evaluate image it sample it see what is there tb develops don't just think of drug resistance first it could be something else tb develops at another site when the patient is already on anti tb treatment again don't think of drug resistance first think of immune reconstitution think of immune suppression and then rule out drug resistance sometimes you see i have had couple of patients with two culture reports from different sites showing drug sensitivity in one report and drug resistance in the other report so what you will do ultimately you have to treat it as a case of drt so culture is always superior all said and done next you know in theory there is no difference between theory and practice but in practice there always is there's always a slip between the cup and the lid next so speed and shortcuts like your gene expert are very good for programmatic purposes they are very good in giving you a rapid diagnosis and they serve us very well today it is a standard of care but in select cases like this one they may not always be the best thing to do you should not stop there you should also go for a dst whenever you are suspecting some comorbidity this is what i want to tell you next so my take home message is you must evaluate investigate every case of tb thoroughly if you are suspecting a case of tb you strive for a definitive diagnosis if it is an extra pulmonary case go for a pathological diagnosis whether it is lymph node pleural fluid and abscess anything always look for a microbiological diagnosis as well let it be your sputum smear let it be your genotypic test like gene expert line probase and ultimately a culture dst you must establish you shouldn't stop after you've established a diagnosis of tb with something else you must establish whether it is drug sensitive or drug resistant because you have to treat and if it is drug resistant then which type mdr or xdr last but not least don't ignore any comorbidity let it be hiv let it be ckd let it be diabetes let it be occupational lung disease let it be anything else you have to treat you see both together next finally you are the clinician that is dealing with the patient and no amount of evidence in trials etc can replace your judgment of what is happening with the patient and these are my last two slides next you know the final word is by dr robert cock whose birthday every year 24th march is celebrated as world tuberculosis day he says it is about time we start taking tb seriously and we started looking at more innovative methods to diagnose and treat tb next these are a few references and with this i conclude i'd like to thank uh, all of you here for giving me a very patient hearing thank you so much sir for your wonderful presentation and a such a nice talk uh, i would like to take up q and a section now uh, yeah so coming towards it so sir what is the main difference between tv tb and covid 
so both the uh, both affected lungs are treatment but the but the treatments are different so can you please explain and throw some light on it so yes so you see uh, we'll start with the etiology covid is a viral infection tuberculosis is a bacterial infection covid multiplies fast you know i'm talking of the bacilli and tuberculosis multiplies very slowly again the treatment you see with covid and tb is different when you treat or isolate your you have to use personal protective measures in both your hand hygiene your cough etiquette your mask they are effective in both for prevention but when it comes to treatment you see you have some effective vaccines for covid that is all you have ultimately no drug seems to be effective in covid except your antibody cocktail and tuberculosis we have definitive treatment but the duration is often longer that is one coming to the lung ultimately you see covid by and large the good point about is that even if it causes extensive lung it, you know tuberculosis causes extensive lung disease almost always you know covid on the other hand causes very minimal lung disease as such most of the time the disease is not severe you have less than i think 5 or 10% of patients who are presenting with severe covid respiratory symptoms are not that severe at all the good thing is, is that it resolves by and large spontaneously and the fibrosis is not persistent even if you follow up patients of post covid fibrosis you know the the lesions is, resolve after 6 to 12 months on the x ray as well but in there is in tuberculosis they do not and particularly in case of tb with occupational lung disease or any underlying lung disorder like bronchiectasis etc you have to continue treating the patient with bronchodilators and corticosteroids even after your tb treatment has stopped thank you so much sir so coming towards the next question uh, so previously three sputum samples were investigated for tb but now only two samples are taken any any specific reason behind that yes the reason is you see we used to take one morning one spot one and one either spot or morning you have to call the patient twice so nowadays we take just two samples either both are spot or one is one spot and one morning the diagnostic accuracy of two samples you see is comparable to that of three sputum samples why three was cut down to two is because you know the diagnostic accuracy is 95% even with two sputum samples so ultimately you are not getting much in terms of diagnosis you are just getting a 5% increase in your uh, detection rate by giving that extra sputum sample that is how it is thank you sir uh, so dr sumit if you would like to uh, throw some light about is tb more prone uh, more prone in rural or urban areas so any surveys or any general awareness programs that are being conducted regarding the same so, uh, actually i had answered this question in the chat box so uh, my take on the subject is that tuberculosis is common in almost all the settings it's just that the different socio economic factors they take 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 into play and uh, because of limited uh, healthcare facilities in and appearances in the rural uh, areas it may be undetected but yeah definitely it's more uh, concentrated in urban slums because of the overcrowding and increased uh, risk of uh, uh, other comorbidities uh, that such as hiv and diabetes uh and the bad is studies are there i am not aware of the studies any right now but uh, yeah awareness programs are being conducted by uh, government uh, under the iec activities that is information education and communication uh nowadays we can even uh, listen to uh, a lot of radio ads in urban areas about the awareness of the problem and likewise a lot of uh, awareness activities are being conducted by the government so that people are aware of the uh um so boss by okay uh, so sir um how to proceed with the, a patient of tuberculosis with traumatic brain injury so any insights regarding that so traumatic brain injury definitely dependent upon the extent of injury first you have to take care about the traumatic brain brain injury but uh, tuberculosis is a common disease But yeah, it, uh, it largely depends on the severity and consciousness level which the blood flow must be of the patient. Whether the patient needs uh, mechanical ventilation or uh, what all things means. Uh, the, the general critical is here: partial beds. They need to be uh, done. We need to take care of bleeding. We need to prevent. Uh, Sir, so can you uh, 
please be a little yeah. Uh, louder. Please. Yeah, so traumatic brain injury is altogether a different issue. It depends upon uh, how severe the injury is and what is the glaucoma scale of the patient. Whether the patient requires any urgent neurosurgical intervention or not. So these are the major issues with traumatic brain injury. Then depending upon patient's uh, awareness and uh, uh, presence of other infections, presence of the presence of comorbidities, hemodynamics, instabilities, all these are general critical care issues which need to be taken care of. Yeah, tuberculosis uh, is also an important disease that if the patient is known to some pulmonary tuberculosis, pulmonary or extra pulmonary tuberculosis, he needs to be continued on uh, anti-tubercular treatment. Traumatic brain injury patient in addition. In addition to general critical care and neurosurgical intervention, they may also require uh, seizure prophylaxis. So, yeah, again, uh, when if the patient is on active tubercular therapy, which you know, usually contains the capsule, which is an enzyme inducer, and if we start to we want the we want to start some anti convulsant therapy to the patient, we need to do that the drug interactions. Maybe for some days uh, we can withhold uh, this recapsulation with some other drugs which are not enzyme inducers. Uh, can I add to that? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. yeah, so very well said. That's very true. We need to look at the drug interactions of rifampicin with commonly used anticonvulsants like phenytoin or even levaracetam. Nowadays, levaracetam is commonly used. And, you know, rifampicin is a microsomal enzyme inducer also. So it decreases, uh, it increases the clearance of these anticonvulsants. So they may not be effective. That is one. What we can do in a drug sensitive case, you see, when we have rifampicin sensitivity detected by gene expert or others, we can use a substitute like rifapentin or rifapentin. Unfortunately, rifapentin is not that easily available in India, but now I think it will be available because the TV control program, TV elimination program is providing rifapentin, is planning to provide rifapentin particularly for TB chemoprophylaxis. So, you know, you can use these uh, rifampicin substitutes. That is one. Number two, if it's a case of drug-resistant TB, you have to avoid the fluoroquinolones completely because they can precipitate seizures. So, this is something we need to look at. And in a patient with uh, visual problems, you know, mostly the patients of brain injury are not conscious, so you cannot actually assess the eye damage that, uh, you know, the retinitis that is done by ethambutol, INHI and linezolid also. So these things sometimes we have to look, take into consideration. Usually they are not a contraindication to giving these drugs, but we have to monitor the patient uh, carefully. This is what I want to say. Uh, so, sir, related to that, so any medication at the time of uh, when the TBI is around, if the glass glaucoma scale is below 4, 4 by 15, so any particular medication related to that? Not really. We, we, uh, we don't uh, change TB medication according to the glass glaucoma scale. We have to see uh, other things as well, like I spoke about. And so we have sir, to monitor the patient as much as possible. You know, mainly these patients have to be treated for the brain injury uh, as a priority because that is what is going to be lethal to the patient more than the TB itself. Okay. So, sir, any genome sequencing that could replace the traditional LPA method in future? So, as of now, the traditional method is not line probe assay, but the gene expert, that is what is being done. Yes, line probe assay is also being followed up. If you get a gene expert positive, we do a first and second and LPA. That is the protocol in the program. It is widely followed also. But you see, as of now, we have something now called whole genome sequencing, which uh, will test your sensitivity or resistance profile to 16 to 18 drugs. However, it is not yet a standard of care. It is being evaluated, I think, uh, in five or six uh, centers in India. And while the WHO has uh, acknowledged that it may be a useful potential tool, may even replace culture, not just a gene expert in line probe assay, but the diagnostic accuracy has to be evaluated and we need to do some kind of what we call point of care standardization tests before it can be accepted. So uh, we're taking up the last question. Uh, so what are the chances of industrial lung disease progression to lung carcinoma and when to suspect it when uh, and when is coexist when it is coexistent with TB? Okay. 
so you see i told you that you have to look for two things in any case who is already diagnosed with occupational lung disease one is infection most commonly tb in our country and the second is malignancy now malignancy first and foremost again is more common in smokers that is one that is why i say you have to stress on smoking cessation every time most of the patients who suffer from occupational lung disease are smokers that is one number 2 you see tb and malignancy can both have a actually common clinical presentation when they develop in a patient of occupational lung disease they will have uh, you see weight loss hemoptysis chest pain you know rapidly progressing uh, disease like respiratory failure etc only thing that fever may be more common in tuberculosis so like i told you what we do with these patients we monitor them every few months you know once the tb is treated we still monitor them every 6 months period we do serial x rays to see if there is anything in the lung disease we assess the lung function from time to time the only way you can diagnose tuberculosis in a patient of occupational lung disease is by going for a uh, you see going for serial screening where you will get a presumptive diagnosis by a ct or x ray like we did in our case or you will get a definitive diagnosis by bronchoscopy bronchoscopy will also help you assess if there is malignancy or not because the ball is sent for everything it is not just sent for tb uh, stain and culture it is sent for histopathology cytology as well so this will tell you whether there is uh, lung cancer is there is cancer or not and keep in mind that a lot of these uh, you know uh, mineral industries can have a high incidence of uh, lung cancer as well the prevalence of lung coming to the first uh, one of the other components of the question what is the prevalence of lung cancer in patients with occupational lung disease it varies from you see depending on which industry and how much is the amount of exposure and whether the patient is a smoker or not because there are multiple factors that come into play at one time again we have seen that as the duration of exposure is more if it is 10 years 20 years 30 years then the incidence of uh, carcinoma goes on increasing they are at greater risk year after year thank you sir thank you for your time i would uh, with this i would like to deliver vote of thanks so it gives me immense gratitude and pleasure that i would now like to thank dr nikhil sarangdhar and dr sumit navani for their constant support and their time to share their views on tb co morbidities and the case presentations related to it we really are in a dire need to spread awareness around tb and also i would like to thank uh, viatris for their constant support during this webinar i would also like to thank all the participants and the attendees who have joined this webinar for their uh, for uh, for dr nikhil sarangda and dr sumit navani and also thanks thank you for being a patient audience as you could see that i have launched the post poll i request all the participants to kindly submit their post polls because their feedback are very valuable to us i would like to inform that we have a series of tv events coming up on uh, medical learning hub so for more information i would like them to kindly like our page on facebook instagram and and as well as on linkedin thank you all thank you for your time and thank you dr nikhil and thank you dr sumit for your time thank you thank you so much yes so you can leave we will be Thank you.